Welcome back, everyone. We are happy to be joined again by Professor Lauren Heller, who is delivering the second part of her lecture on the wealth and poverty of nations. Professor Heller. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jason. Um, so I'm excited to be back with you all. Um, remember where we sort of left off last time that I told you we, we were going to tackle, right? We were going to talk about last time we talked about inequality from um, more of a U.S. centric perspective or maybe why we care about inequality even in rich countries and I sort of tried to make the argument that there's two reasons we might care about inequality. One was crony capitalism, the other was poverty. Uh, so now let's talk about the poverty part of wealth and poverty and remember um, this slide that I was sort of showing you at the beginning of the last lecture that's sort of the basis uh, for development economics as a whole. Uh, well, if you care about poverty, uh, sort of welcome to the club, right? So this is the basis of development economics. So for the past 200-ish years, um, as the Industrial Revolution particularly took hold, people have tried to come up with theories why some nations grow, why some stagnate. Uh, some of these theories were really, really bad, uh, but some less so. Um, and so we should talk about those, uh, especially because we want to learn from the mistakes of those who've come before us. And what we'll also find out is that we haven't always learned from those mistakes. Um, and so that's what I want to sort of get to first. So bad idea number one um, has to do with population growth. And this goes all the way back to Thomas Malthus. Now, I know that you're saying, you're probably saying, why is this discussion in a IHS seminar about contemporary challenges. Uh, but I guarantee you, if you look out in the development literature today, uh, particularly among non-economists, um, sociologists, but also among economists at say the World Bank and other places, population and growth is still an idea that people talk about today. And it all goes back to Malthus. I'm going to give you guys Malthus in two minutes, which is a really, really quick and dirty Malthus. I'm happy to talk about him more in the Q&A if you'd like, because I do want to make sure to give his arguments um, full weight and not create a straw man just because we're going quickly. But here's the basic idea. He's writing in about 1798. And he says, look, uh, essentially, what do humans do, right? Is that we're at subsistence for this long period of time. And remember, Malthus is writing at the beginning of this hockey stick, right? So he does not have the benefit of hindsight that we might today. And he says, okay, so the minute income rises above a subsistence level, we sort of turn on Barry White, we say, how you doing? And then babies happen, right? And then you guys can go to your biology professors or something to talk about how that happens. Uh, but then essentially, an increase in population drives income back down to a subsistence level. Why, what do babies do? They eat things, right? Uh, they do many other things, but one particularly thing that they do is consume resources. And it's this is a very quick mouth as to be a little more um, creating something other than a straw man, but a steel man, what's his reasoning for this? And it actually relies on this idea of diminishing marginal returns. So he's, Malthus is pretty classical um, in his sort of economics, right? I mean, we put him with um, Smith, Ricardo, some of the others, right? Writing at about the same time. And so we're getting to this idea of diminishing marginal returns that as population would grow exponentially, particularly Malthus is writing in an era before birth control. He himself had many, many kids, which I think is actually kind of funny, right? That the guy that talks about we shouldn't have as much population had so many kids. Um, anyway, the idea is that population grows exponentially, but because we're adding more and more people, more and more labor, to a fixed plot of land, right, with fixed capital, that the um, that as a result, those returns to that fixed plot of land are going to diminish, and so any increase in income above subsistence is soon eliminated by rapid population growth. So even many economists get the reputation of economics as a dismal science from Malthus. That is not true, actually. Uh, economics gets the reputation of being a dismal science from reacting to the eugenicists, so I'm pretty proud of that distinction. Uh, but everyone thinks it's because of Malthus, because Malthus is super depressing. Okay, um, but the good news is, is there's something missing from this picture. There's a reason I said this is the first bad idea that we were going to talk about, right? Um, 
is that Malthus isn't really accounting for the agricultural revolution, right? Remember, he's writing at the beginning of the hockey stick of the industrial revolution. We can't really blame him in some ways, but he's not accounting for all of the amazing improvements we're gonna have from entrepreneurial discovery, technology. We can get a whole lot more stuff out of a fixed plot of land now than we ever could uh, when he was writing. Right, so it's not just that we face diminishing marginal returns, it's this classic example of technology staving off diminishing marginal returns that he didn't quite think about. Um, also, another thing that we need to think about is yes, babies eat, right? They are consumption, right, machines at first, but then you know what babies do? Uh, they grow up. So as we have more humans in the world, they're not just increased consumers, there are also increased resources in the form of labor. Um, so it's really about how productive that next unit of labor is going to be and how much ability that next unit of labor has to contribute to economic growth. And we're gonna see that that can be largely dependent on the institutional framework that that person is born into, lots of other things. Um, so it's not, the good news is, is that it's not about population because if you think about it, some of the implications of a population-based um, model are pretty horrifying when we talk about, um, they're pretty tame when they come from things like the World Bank and we talk about, you know, sort of dropping condoms in developing countries, uh, but there's much worse implications you could think of in terms of, you know, forced or sterilizations or the one-child policy in China, an absolutely horrific um, human rights policy that comes from this very idea, right? Um, and so idea number two, right, so the good news is we have lots of things that we can use to refute Malthus, right? Uh, the next sort of idea I want to talk about, which was not a great idea, but we'll see why, um, is this sort of neoclassical approach. Um, and sometimes traditional economics gets lumped into this. So neoclassical growth theory usually assumes for the economists in the room um, that the country is operating on an efficient point on its production possibilities curve or production possibilities frontier. Um, for my non-economists in the room, that essentially says there's no big bills left on the sidewalk, right? There's no efficiency gains um, that we could potentially be missing in this. Markets are clearing, right? Um, all of the normal sort of efficiency things we think about economics are happening in these economies. Um, and so if that's the case, right, what factors might shift out the production possibilities frontier, right? What factors might contribute to economic growth? Um, decrease poverty, right? And economists, and there's plenty of studies that talk about the relationship between economic growth and poverty pretty widely accepted that one way to alleviate poverty overall um, is to increase economic growth. Lots of evidence to support that. Okay, so what factors might shift production possibilities? Well, one great one we're building on the Malthusian argument is technological progress, right? If we can get it. Um, so the agricultural revolution is one big huge reason why Malthus was wrong. There are others. Um, another one that I forgot to mention is that children aren't just production goods, that as we have more kids, um, they're actually, and as we grow in wealth, they turn into consumption goods. Um, so we don't just have children to work on the farm, we have children because we enjoy them. Um, and we actually see fertility decreases. We tend to have fewer kids and we invest more in each of those kids. Um, but anyway, so another um, argument that neoclassicals might have would be technological progress. And in general, I agree with them on this, um, that technological progress is a great thing for economies, but can we just assume that this will happen? Right? So let's think about what, what is the petri dish we need to incubate technologi not, ooh, technological progress. Um, and so we want to think about that. Uh, we'll also see an importance of entrepreneurship in fueling this. So stay tuned because we're going to talk more about entrepreneurship when I talk about what as individuals we can do, right? Okay, so another argument that could potentially shift out our production possibilities frontier in a very um, neoclassical mindset would be an increase in the resource base um, for an economy. So if you could think about um, increased investment in physical and human capital. For the non-economists in the room, what do I mean by human capital? I mean the stuff that makes labor more productive. Think about health, 
education is a classic example of human capital. So these are things that we invest in now, just like physical capital, we can end up having more stuff um, in the long term, right? More machines now means more stuff later. Um, a more literate population now, a healthier population now means more productive labor later. Things like that. But, right, um, what this might mean, right, is they talked about um, this idea of there was an investment in technology gap, right? We've seen this in history, it's particularly since around the 1950s, um, this idea that there was a gap between rich countries and poor countries and the amount of capital and the amount of investment that was going on, particularly in technology. If you want to think about models like this, the solo model is a great one that um, the economists are probably learned their first year in graduate school um, that relates to this. So all those differential equations you guys had to do, this is kind of the literature that this was placed in. And so um, why can't we just, okay, if there's this gap, right? Why can't we just fill this gap with something like foreign aid, right? Um, and so this leads to what I like to call voluntourism, right? Is there a way, because we, we see these, right? Um, this is an Onion article, but you see those ads on TV, right? For only the price of a cup of coffee, you too could save a person in Burundi or something. Um, I hate those ads. So I kind of love this Onion article, this Onion magazine um, cover, which says, for only $5 a month, you can help continue photographing this child, right? Or you've probably seen on the internet, you know, your friends have gone off and done what I call volunteerism, right? You went and did it at Barry. The students love to talk about mission trips in developing countries where they went and took pictures with poor people and really felt, you know, fulfilled by doing this, right? And often those um, mission trips tend to be in tropical countries that are very nice to visit. Some of them where they speak English, like Belize is really popular for this, right? Um, and it, we can get lots of warm fuzzies from this. Uh, but in reality, right, these kinds of things aren't actually going to change the sort of systemic issues that we worry about when we think about poverty, okay? Um, so, um, in the 1950s and 60s, right, we get this idea at a macroeconomic level, right? So rather than the microeconomic people going out and, you know, building wells and whatnot, uh, we get this big push argument that um, essentially what we can do is we can drop aid from uh, developing country, I mean, developed countries into poor countries, and it would give them the big push they needed to sort of trigger the growth process, right? There's an investment in technology gap, no big deal, we can do that for them, right? And this is what, how the World Bank got so controversial with a lot of this, right? So they would do things like um, drop aid in the form of a dam in a developing country, so a big infrastructure project, and, and um, developing countries would take out loans potentially um, to build this dam, right? Um, Jeff Sachs in a famous book, I mean, he got so famous for this book called The End of Poverty. Um, this is the sort of, his sort of argument for the Millennium Development Villages and things that he started um, in sort of the mid 2000s. Um, he sort of argues this um, among other folks, right? That we need this big push um, to sort of adopt villages and things and, um, and trigger the growth process. He thinks he's doing something pretty new at this time, uh, but really there's a few things he's doing. Um, one is just this hark back to the big push argument again, uh, but another is he talked about um, countries being landlocked and not having access um, to trade networks and other things. Well, that right goes all the way back to 1776 Smith, right? So Smith argues this in chapter of the wealth of nations, right? Um, so essentially, um, this is the idea that these ideas are coming back again and again and again. I think they were pretty right uh, when they said it's all in Smith, right? Um, but essentially, this big push argument is one of the sort of economic theories behind why we might need foreign aid to trigger economic growth. Um, unfortunately, it'd be kind of great if this worked. Uh, but unfortunately, there's a whole lot missing from this picture, right? And so we have lots of books that have been written. I, I would recommend all three of these books 
um, if you guys are interested in reading further on this issue. Um, grad students in economics in particular, if you're wondering what all those um, economic models you had to do in your macroeconomics class and why you had to do any of them, um, Bill Easterly in this book goes really nicely through um, what those models are and like what they really meant. So that was a good one, but all three of these are pretty good. Um, and the idea is, um, a, a common theme among all three is while the theory sounds good, right, a lot of the aid is really ineffective, okay, um, both in because of the way it's distributed um, and in the institutions in the country itself. So often aid can be used to prop up corrupt authoritarian regimes, it prevents needed institutional change that we might otherwise want, as we'll see in a minute. Um, really, um, institutions can be a pretty big key to economic growth, as many of you might already know. Um, so that becomes um, a real issue as well. Um, and then let's talk about food aid, y'all, just for a second. Um, we, as a result of um, agricultural subsidies and other things in this country, we do sometimes tend to drop food aid in developing countries. And you can think, what could potentially be wrong with this, right? Maybe there's foreign aid that's distributed badly, right? In the form of maybe we sell weapons, that's one um, example of foreign aid. It's not so great too, right? Um, as we might sell weapons and other things to developing countries. And there's, those could obviously be really bad, but who can argue with food, right? There's poor countries, right? And there's poor kids in these countries that need to eat, right? Look at the commercial where the kid um, for only $5 a day, you can save this individual. Well, um, the problem is that this tends to disrupt markets in less developed countries. So it's not like people in developing countries can't possibly grow their own food, right? Um, and so if you're a farmer in a developing country, um, this is potentially the worst thing ever. That We saw this in Haiti, post-earthquake. Um, we we've seen this in lots of different places. Um, and so what happens is the U.S. might come and give food to folks, um, but if you're a farmer in a developing country, that depresses food prices. And so then all of a sudden, um, you can't make money for your crops, right? And all of a sudden, you can't um, subsist on agriculture anymore, and it might cause movement to cities and other things that might be um, less ideal. So uh, whereas we talk about it's kind of like the idea where we say, you know, give a man a fish, feed him for a day, um, teach a man to fish, feed him for a lifetime, right? Well, this is the sort of equivalent of giving a man a fish and then taking away his fishing pole, right? Um, so there's been lots of pushback against um, food aid in developing countries for that reason. Um, so the real big key here that I think you guys might have known that I was going to get to is that unless growth-oriented policies are adopted, foreign aid is going to continue to be ineffective. And so um, the better idea, idea number three that I want to talk about, is this idea of new institutional growth theory, right, which is this focus on institutions. So a um, new institutional theory doesn't rely on the assumptions like um, a country is at an efficient point on its production possibilities frontier, that there aren't big bills left on the sidewalk. In many poor countries, right, with poor institutional quality, we can't assume this, right? Thanks to high levels of corruption, um, there might very well be lots of inefficiencies that we can capitalize on. Um, and so this kind of theory accounts for those institutions and the incentives that govern the way the economy operates in the first place. Um, this is a pretty big deal and a pretty cool thing because uh, the good news about new institutional theory is when throughout history we've seen countries get the institutions right, they've been able to explode in growth, right? Because they're operating at a point within their production possibilities frontier. Um, and so they can make really big gains. They can pick those big bills that are left on the sidewalk and end up with more growth overall. And so we're really back, right? All the way back to what Adam Smith said. Um, in 1755 that we discussed in our last lecture, this idea of peace, easy taxes, and a tolerable administration of justice um, can really be key in the new institutional theory. It has its roots all the way back in Smith, as lots does. Okay, so that's new institutional theory, right? But 
what can we do as individuals, right? So I've been advocating for things like good institutions, um, but that really doesn't help us as individuals, right? Um, you might be saying things like, um, okay, Heller, like that's all well and good, right? Um, but that doesn't really satisfy me, right? It's not like we can or should go over to poor countries and install better institutions, but we've totally tried that, tried that, right? Hello, Iraq. Uh, and it really always ends badly, right? So what can we do, right? Uh, well, one one that I'm just going to drop and leave because I think Fabio did a much better job than I could ever do of explaining it, is if we really cared about um, institutions and individuals in developing countries, it's really hard to transport institutions into another country, right? Um, you need all kinds of things for good institutions to develop. Culture needs to be there. The political environment needs to be right. And it's generally really, nation building is not a business we want to get in. Right? So one great way to transport institutions to people is to move the people to the institutions, right? Um, so open the borders, do it now, do it yesterday, right? Uh, but I recognize that as an individual, it's not like we can do that very easily, right? We can advocate for it. We can um, talk to folks that we know and talk about the benefits of open borders. We can create an environment in our society that is much more open to free movement across people. It's one of the reasons of people across borders. It's one of the reasons I love teaching for IHS so much, right? This is how we can contribute to this, but it's not like we're governments that can make this decision. So what can we do as an individual? Well, as an individual, we might be able to support property rights, for example, um, to help the poor achieve their dreams. I'll give you uh, one example of this. Um, that I think is a great example of a superhero that I would like to talk about. Um, and that superhero's name is Hernando de Soto. So um, there is a great video clip. Um, it's a little long, so I wouldn't have normally shown it to you guys um, in a lecture like this, even if I could have, um, that talks about this, this guy named Eusebio in Peru. It's called Eusebio's Dream. And basically what he talks about is he's a farmer in Peru and uh, he had property rights taken away from him. He was on a communal farm. Um, before that, um, he basically had no access to be able to invest in his property, right? He had no uh, legal ownership title to the property that he farmed. Um, and so as a result, um, he talked about how he dreamed of this title, right? We often don't think about that um, in rich countries, we don't think about what it might mean to not be able to have a title to a property, right? Um, it's something that we think of as second nature, right? Can you imagine not being able to know who owns your house, right? Or your car? We don't think about these things. Um, and so um, he, and as a result, right, the good news about Eusebio um, is he eventually right, received a former formal title to his property. Um, largely through the participation of this guy, right? So this is Hernando de Soto. Um, he runs a nonprofit that actually goes through and helps um, poor folks in Peru and other places unlock the value of their property um, by helping them obtain titles. So um, I think if you can think of things that you could do, right, to um, alleviate poverty, try to be more like Hernando. Right, not all heroes wear capes. I think this guy kind of deserves one um, in his ability as an individual, right, to go out and help affect real change um, for the poor, right? And he's got a great book, which many of you might have read, called The Mystery of Capital, which talks about um, the capital essentially that's locked um, in developing countries. Um, so, another thing we could do as individuals. Um, is to encourage entrepreneurs or even become one yourself. You know, lots of people think about, um, well, what do I want to do to affect change in the world? And they think I'm going to go become a politician, right? I'm going to go into public service. I don't love that term, right? Or I'm going to support the right politicians. Um, in my personal opinion, I don't know that there is such a thing as the right politician. So what about supporting in entrepreneurs um, as an individual or becoming one? 
right? Um, and then the third thing I want to talk about is in, in I'm sorry, the fourth thing, I messed up the numbering here, but is to talk about not creating barriers for the poor uh, with self-defeating policies. So in terms of encouraging entrepreneurship, um, we know, right, that entrepreneurial discovery drives economic growth and decreases poverty. This is something we absolutely know. We have lots of research that is always ongoing about how we can encourage entrepreneurship, um, but we've pretty much decided um, as econo economists that entrepreneurship, when we can make it happen in the right sort of petri dish of an environment, um, can decrease poverty. And these can be big things. These can be technological improvements from some sort of scientific discovery. This is a close-up of a printing press. Think about the way that the printing press revolutionized society in so many ways. And my favorite thing about the printing press example is it's already becoming obsolete. Think about how little we use paper now. Think about what a big improvement that was when it happened. It can be something like that, but it doesn't even have to be a new scientific discovery, right? Entrepreneurial discovery can also be involved in innovations from application and dissemination. So a classic example of this is Henry Ford. So Henry Ford did not invent the automobile, right? Um, all he invented is he took Adam Smith's idea of the division of labor, right? The idea of decreased time switching tasks. If you guys have read any part of the Wealth of Nations in the second chapter, it talks about one of the reasons the division of labor contributes to the greatest improvement in the productive power of labor is that if you focus on one thing, you don't have to put your stuff down, and switch to another task. Well, essentially what Henry Ford did in his entrepreneurial discovery uh, was he sort of kicked it up a notch, right? He said, look, not only are, do people not have to put stuff down, we're gonna create an assembly line where stuff comes to them, right? Seems like a pretty simple idea when you think about it, but had profound implications on the world, right? Henry Ford was his, a hero in his own way. He made the automobile accessible to vast swaths of humanity, never would have been able to um, afford it otherwise. In some ways, he was an environmental entrepreneur. Why? Um, the big problem in the environment when Henry Ford was around uh, was not um, the ozone layer or something like that that we might blame automobiles for. It was horse poop right? And all kinds of, the streets were clogged with it, right? Um, and through the invention of the automobile, he solved a really big environmental problem, right, of the early 1900s. And by the way, right, this is a picture of my campus, Barry College, where I'm from, um, and these are the Ford buildings that were donated by Henry Ford in honor of his wife, Clara. Um, and my point about this is that Henry Ford did not do this for the benefit of his own heart, right? Henry Ford didn't invent the assembly line because he wanted to make humanity better, right? What did he do this? Because he wanted to make money, right? And as a result, um, essentially, he made a gazillion dollars. It's a technical term, a gazillion dollars from doing this. Um, and as a result, like he was able to do things like build these buildings, like just as, oh, like cute, like Clara wants a present. Right? I mean, the amount of wealth that Henry Ford generated for himself, as well as society, was astronomical, right? just from this little innovation that we think about. Right? So entrepreneurship does not have to be inventing the cure for cancer. It can be a new way to apply something, a new way to disseminate information, just an arbitrage opportunity. Right? But it even doesn't have to be that. So I can make the argument um, that um, here's my basic idea, is that I think if I can convince you that entrepreneurship matters for the most shallow invention in the history of humanity, I can probably convince you that entrepreneurship matters um, for something more important, right? So my thought, just kind of like Friedman um, picked a medical licensure as a way to argue back against um, occupational licensing, right? I'm going to pick um, the hardest case for entrepreneurship as an argument for entrepreneurship. So let's see, what is potentially the most shallow, silly invention um, that I could think of in society? So how about 
the snuggie, right? This is the most, but potentially one of the most shallow inventions on the face of the planet, right? Someone took a blanket, right? Pulled right here, added, added three stitches here and three stitches here and poof, made a gazillion dollars, right? So you could look at the Snuggie and be and say something like, this is the problem with markets or capitalism or neoliberalism or whatever pejorative term you might want to use, right? Is sure, we have a million Snuggies, right? But we still have inequality in the world, right? Or we have a better refrigerator, but who cares, right? Well, Right? And this and this might be true. So these people, right, made a gazillion dollars and they have all kinds of different Snuggies, right? The Snuggie was a huge hit on the Today Show, right? Um, you have Snuggies for your favorite sports team. You have a camo Snuggie, right? Though you wouldn't know it. I can't see those people. Uh-huh. Um, or, right, um, you have a Snuggie for your favorite pet, right? Or uh, maybe my favorite, right, for formal occasions, you have the tuxedo snuggie, right? Um, and so you might look at this and think like, this is the problem with entrepreneurship. Well, let me tell you guys a little story um, from my personal life. So um, my husband was raised by his um, grandmother. Her name's Blanche Heller, or her name was Blanche Heller. She's since passed away. And sort of this great matriarch um, of the family. So much so my daughter's middle name is Blanche after her. Okay. And, you know, we're first dating and I'm trying to figure out, and actually we were first married and I am trying to figure out Christmas presents for the family. Like it's sort of one of my jobs and I am flipping out. Like, what am I going to do? Blanche was in a nursing home at the time undergoing rehab. Um, she was 96 at the time. Uh, here's the thing about 96 year old people. Uh, they don't do a whole lot right? Like her family worked for the railroad for years, but like, if you ever tried to get railroad stuff for somebody, it's all for little kids, right? You cannot find an adult railroad thing to save your soul. I didn't know what I was going to do, right? And so here I am, and I'm, I'm flipping out. It's before Christmas, and I'm walking through Bed Bath & Beyond flipping out, right? Um, what am I going to do? And there, behold, I see it on the shelf, right? It is a deluxe Snuggie, right? Would you like to know what makes a sluggy, Snuggie deluxe? Uh, it's sort of like a reversed Ugg boot. It's like half fake fur, half fake suede, if you know what I mean. Uh, but anyway, so I'm like, okay, this might work, right? And I wrap it up um, and I, we bring it to the nursing home at Christmas and I'm nervous, right? Uh, but then all of a sudden she opens up um, this package from her grandkids and y'all, her eyes light up. She is so excited about this, right? She apparently had a real problem keeping blankets on her at the nursing home. There was a movement issue, right? And blankets kept falling off. And if she could have this Snuggie, she could stay warm. She was so excited, right? And we're wheeling her to dinner, right? For Christmas dinner in the nursing home. And she is telling everybody about this Snuggie. She is so excited and telling them that her grandkids got her this and how exciting it is. The Snuggie saved Christmas. Okay. Uh, and so you might look at the Snuggie and think, um, what a shallow invention, right? Um, but it wasn't shallow to me, right? It wasn't shallow um, to Blanche, right? It affected real change um, for us. Um, this is a picture of Blanche shortly before she passed away with me and my husband. Um, and it mattered to her, right? Thanks to the idea that the value of a good is subjective, why is it our place, right, to say what entrepreneurship is valuable and what isn't, right? Um, if we can think about it, how can we even know what entrepreneurship is valuable? other than through this dispersed knowledge sharing mechanism we call a market. And as a result, right, I'm actually pretty excited that the entrepreneurs that invented the Snuggie made a gazillion dollars. It's not like they were thinking in their head, man, I wanna invent a Snuggie to help folks like Blanche Heller stay warm, right? Or to help folks like Lauren Heller save Christmas, right? But they did it anyway, right, as a result. And so if something like a Snuggie 
right, can affect change. Imagine what the others can, okay? And so if we can have a Snuggie that also helps us to eliminate poverty, bonus, right? But don't we need markets for all of this though, right? So you might say, okay, well, the Snuggie's great, right? But why do we even need markets for it, right? Why can't we just have somebody else decide, right? Um, invent things and sell it at whatever price we want, right? Or have, or maybe we have some kind of market. This is this idea behind market socialism, right? We can have some sort of market, but then we'll tweak the levers, right? To sort of help with some of this inequality stuff that we might not like. Right? We'll have all the benefits of a market without some of this distasteful inequality stuff. Well, here's the thing. Entrepreneurs need a chance um, to try out new ideas. If they're good, right? They need profits um, to send them that signal that they're the right thing. But it's also important that resources aren't wa wasted on crap, right? Literally, I'll give you guys one more example. Um, so um, there were two inventions that I thought would change my life uh, when I was in graduate school. Uh, one did and one didn't. One that changed my life for about 200 bucks at the time was a Keurig K-cup coffee maker. I love them. Um, I drink a lot of coffee, but I'm the only one in my household who does. This thing is a lifesaver, right? Love it. On the other hand, right, when I was in grad school, there was um, another invention that I thought would change my life and didn't, and that was a self-cleaning litter box. It also was not cheap, right? And I went, and we had two cats at the time, uh, and I thought, hey, this is going to change my life, right? I don't have to deal with cat poop anymore. This seems great. Uh, and it worked. Um, and I went online and I looked at Amazon reviews and people were, you know, generally positive. So I went and I shelled out the dough for this thing and it worked for about a week. Right. Um, but then after that, uh, it turns out that this horrible piece of plastic uh, clogged and was horrible. And it was literally a crappy situation. Huh, huh, right. Um, and I was mad, right? So I went and I returned this to the store, right? And, and wrote a horrible review online and found out afterwards that other folks had updated their reviews um, and that they also had a similar problem. And then um, a few uh, months later, I was walking around in PetSmart or whatever, looking at various things. And would you like to know what was not on the shelf anymore? that brand of self-cleaning litter box. Guys, you wanna talk about justice? That's justice, right? So how were the makers of the self-cleaning litter box different than the makers of the Keurig coffee maker, right? These guys wasted society's resources, right? They made a crappy product and it's really important that they incurred losses to tell them that, right? The plastic and other materials they used in making this um, were wasteful of society's resources. They needed a mechanism to tell them that. No one individual could possibly have told them that. Right? They needed a market to do so. In the same way, the inventors of the Curry K-Cup coffee maker, Green Mountain Coffee Roasters, right, and the Snuggie, they needed profits to show that people, right, in general, adore these things. Without a market economy, we don't have ways to differentiate this product from this one, right? I consider myself a fairly smart person. I thought both of these things were gonna change my life, but the thing is one individual can't possibly make that decision, right? So we need markets to be able to figure out what entrepreneurship is valued by society and what's not. Okay. And lastly, right? What's another thing we could do um, individually besides encouraging entrepreneurs or becoming one? Don't get in the way of the poor, if at all possible. So um, one example of this, right? Um, occupational licensing, a great example of something that gets in the way of the poor, right? So we have occupational licensing for um, medical doctors, right? We have it for pharmacists, right? We have it even for accountants, right? And maybe for some of these things, you might think some of this is legitimate, right? Um, but what about egg sorters, 
What about dog trainers? What about hair braiders? What about yacht boat captains? What about tree trimmers? All of these groups um, have occupational licenses in certain states. Is that necessarily efficient? Lots of these are potentially entry level positions. Do we need to prevent the poor from being able to have opportunities like that? Right? Um, and you know, this again goes all the way back to Smith, right? So why do we have these things? And Smith argues that people of the same trade seldom meet together, even for merriment and diversion, but in the conversations in a conspiracy against the public or in some contrivance to raise prices, right? So what are you saying? Who wants occupational licenses for the hair braiders? Current cosmetologists, right? Who, think it's a, who thinks it's a great idea for yacht drivers to be able to get a license? Current yacht drivers, right? The same with doctors, right? The American Medical Association controls um, licensure by controlling the number of uh, medical school slots for physicians, right? Um, this would be like letting economists, like letting me control how many new PhDs we create in economics. Let me tell you, now that I already have a PhD and I've been through this, I think we have too many, right? Why? Because I want a higher salary for me, right? So I think in lots of studies, right, from um, groups like the Institute for Justice, which is another um, superhero group in my view, um, has lots of evidence about how this kind of thing disproportionately affects poor folks in the United States, disproportionately affects women, um, and lots of other groups that we might think might be marginalized in society. So if you really care about poverty and inequality, let's at least get the low hanging fruit out of the way. All right, so if you really care about poverty, I think most of you have probably seen um, economic freedom indicators in way or another, one way or another, uh, but care about this, right? So this is um, a graph about um, the income level of the lowest 10% um, and um, economic freedom rankings from the most free to the least free. And we see the countries with the best institutional quality, the most um, institutions that correspond to what Adam Smith probably wanted. That's the places where the poorest people in those countries do the best, right? But you might say, well, that's just because they're richer overall, right? What about inequality more generally? What if we do care about inequality within countries? Right? Well, those also show that inequality within countries between the most free and the least free um, is not that different across quartiles. So if you really care about poverty, if you want to end poverty, and when we discuss wealth, poverty, and inequality, then care about this. Okay? Thanks very much, guys. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Professor Heller. And we do have uh, several good questions. And uh, this this discussion has unsurprisingly led to uh, led to quite a few good challenges as well. So first, one of the questions that we had from the breakout groups was just a, a more general question. How is poverty defined? Bad, kind of like inequality, badly, uh, but better, in some ways better than um, inequality. Um, it's also really subjective. So worldwide measures of poverty, um, they, it used to be sort of a dollar a day purchasing power standard um, was the measure for extreme poverty by folks at the World Bank and other folks that generally agree on these things. Now it's been upward adjusted to somewhere around $2 per day um, as a measure of extreme poverty. Uh, but what's interesting is that differs a whole lot than say poverty lines in the United States, right? So if you look at who makes the poverty line in the United States, which is important because lots of different sort of social welfare programs we have are based on the poverty line, right? Um, it's those folks would never, right, fall under the world poverty line, right? So the poorest person in the United States probably makes more than $2 a day, right? Um, and so poverty lines can sometimes be defined politically, as you might not be surprised, um, but they do differ a whole lot between uh, global poverty measures and within a country like the U.S. What kinds of equality can we have in a capitalist society? Maybe like quality of moral authority, uh, you know, certain sorts of political equality? Yeah, I mean, I think we could have that. I think we could have um, equality of um, 
purchasing power with our dollar, right? So um, the beautiful thing, right, is that um, capitalism and markets in general discourage sort of the pretty woman moment. Do you guys know what I mean by this? I don't know that you know what I mean by this. Um, first of all, you all need to go watch Pretty Woman if you haven't, because you will make your professors feel less old if you haven't. Uh, but it, 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 long story, um, this, this uh, let's see, adult um, sex worker, okay, um, gets um, hired in, um, by this guy and she's going to spend the week with him and she goes into a um, fa fancy women's boutique in Rodeo Drive. And they look at her, right, and look at what she's wearing and say, you know what, we really just don't want to serve you, right? Like, we don't want your kind in here, right, essentially. Um, and she leaves and feels all dejected. And eventually, right, she ends up coming back, right, with um, a sort of personal shopper, right? Um, and they go in and she comes in with a bunch of money and says, hey, right? Remember me, right? Do you remember me from, right, a few weeks ago? Like, big mistake, right? Big mistake. And so uh, what she was essentially saying is, like, I had all this purchasing power, and you didn't treat me as an equal, and as a result, you lost tons of business from this, right? So in some ways, um, markets can have this egalitarian effect of it doesn't matter uh, who you are, who your mom is, right, what color you are, uh, what your sexual orientation is, um, a good entrepreneur wants your money, right? And if um, and if they don't treat you well, there's all kinds of literature from Becker and other folks to support this. Uh, if they don't treat you well, they'll probably go out of business um, or at least earn less profit than they otherwise would. Uh, and so I think there's that sort of great equalizing force too that we forget about um, in markets. They've sort of um, helped decrease some of the class distinctions that we used to see, you know, with nobility and other things, which I think is kind of a great thing. Okay, so uh, a few uh, more challenging questions. So uh, who, in your view, is the most insightful interlocutor who disagrees with you? And why are their arguments the most difficult to address? Okay. Um, all right, so let's see, the person that disagrees with me. Um, I really think, for example, somebody like Esther Duflo is interesting, right? So for those who don't know that, who that is, um, it's actually the second ever female Nobel laureate in economics. The first one was Eleanor Ostrom, shout out, right? Um, she was also the youngest Nobel laureate in history. She won a few years ago. Um, she rejected a paper of mine when I was first starting out from the American Economic Journal, but I will not hold her that against her. She rejected me on Christmas Day, too, and I cried. So graduate students, there's hope for you. Like, if you're, you can, you can come out of this. But anyway, um, she's done some really interesting work um, looking at randomized control trials in economics um, and sort of getting past a lot of the problems we have um, in um, social science with uh, what we call endogeneity problems, which is a very fancy word for talking about um, people don't behave, like we can't treat people like lab rats, thank God, right? We can't just randomly assign um, a treatment of, say, living in a slum or something to one group and not another for many ethical reasons. Um, and randomized control trials, in some ways, have sort of revolutionized part of the microeconomic literature um, in development, which I think is really cool. Uh, but on the other hand, one of the reasons I really disagree with her is we still have this pesky institutional problem that we have to deal with, right? So no amount, even if we get the right amount of money to charge for a mosquito bed net, just right, right? We still have to chart, we still have to talk about the market for the mosquito bed net situated within a context in institutions that matter right? Uh, we still have to think about um, the individual incentives that, the, that this create, and there's no amount of perfect scientific tweaking that we could do that would necessitate interventionism in the economy. Like, I understand that the, the foreign aid arguments are compelling, but I just think it's the very nature of foreign aid and those things that means it's really impossible to get it right. But I really do 
sort of respect her um, as an economist for the work she's trying to do. So relatedly, is there no role for civil society or government in helping the poor? Are markets the only approach? Well, so I think there is definitely a role for government, just maybe not in the way we think about it. So I'm not an anarchist, just sorry. Um, but um, I do think we do, we definitely need things like an impartial judiciary um, to help adjudicate disputes, right? So uh, we've seen what happens when, for example, we make things illegal and people can't act in a formal judicial system. Look at the drug war, right? Look at lots of other things. Um, increased use of violence to resolve disputes, poor quality products that happen in black markets. I think it's great evidence um, that we need some sort of fair rules of the game, but also um, clear judicial system or something in that way, um, where again, it doesn't matter who you are, um, who your daddy is, right? Or any other thing about you, you can get a fair hearing at court. So I think the government has a huge um, role in that way. Um, in terms of direct poverty alleviation, I think in many cases, um, it actually might hurt more than it helps. Like I would love, I would love it guys. I would love it if there was a way that I could be out of a job as a development economist. Like I would love it if there was a way that the government could come in and fix something. I just don't, I don't see it. Um, but yeah, I do think there's still a, some role for government for sure. Aren't critics of products like the Snuggie uh, or uh, the Keurig uh, more likely to argue that these products come with externalities that don't get paid by the company or the consumer? I'm guessing things like pollution and things like that. Yeah. Um, especially for things like the Snuggie that don't seem to be made to last. Okay. So, um, well, the thing is, there, there's several things to about this. Um, okay. And one is that environmental protection is a normal good, right? So if we, if, and if we think about, well, here, I should go back. What do I mean by a normal good? A good that we buy more of as our incomes increase, okay? And if you think about the vast majority of big environmental problems in the world, right? It's not necessarily by buying fewer Keurig K-cups, right? Or not having a Snuggie. It has to do with things like um, huge amounts of, say, coal production, right, in China and pollution, right, as a result of um, being a poor country, right, or at least a middle-income country now for China, right? And so what we found, um, and again, I wish I had a graph, I need a whiteboard here, uh, but we need, um, we can think about things like the environmental crucible, curve, which I'm talking about a non-linear relationship um, between economic degradation um, and poverty. I'm mean, sorry, environmental degradation and poverty. And so essentially what we can show is what happens as people grow, um, two things. One, they switch to more service-based um, and more efficient production, right? So um, we see less pollution as a result, both from the industry mix, but also more importantly from the kinds of industry and the kinds of, say, power that's being used and things like that. Uh, but number two, they also do sort of clamor for more um, environmental regulation, but they also clamor to have more environmentally based products. Like you do not care um, if your chicken is organic, uh, if you're not eating, if you can't buy chicken, right? You don't care um, if your um, sheets were, you know, responsibly sourced with organic cotton or whatever, if you don't have them in the first place. Right, and so if we care about environmental issues, I, my first answer to this is that we need to care about economic growth first, right? Um, my second argument is that um, who decides, right? So who decides that a Keurig is where we want to worry about our environmental costs, right? And not something else, right? And why is it that the individual can't decide, at least at some level, right? So I actually, um, I, my love for my Keurig is famous around my office, and I once had a, uh, a faculty member from the marketing department come um, with me, and I swear to God, y'all, he, um, he was holding a cup of coffee in a styrofoam coffee cup, and he goes, you know, those Keurigs are really environmentally wasteful. And I'm like, dude, 
dude, you're looking at me in my reusable mug with my Keurig and you've decided that my Keurig is the problem? Like, let's talk about this, right? Let's talk about this hypocrisy. Um, and so I think um, in some ways, growth can um, shift people towards caring more about the environmental consciousness of their products. Um, but also, um, we need to have a larger philosophical conversation, I think, about who gets to decide and what the implications of that are and what the benefits of that are for the environment too. Do journalistic outlets have a positive obligation to inform their audiences about the reductions in poverty that have taken place? I wish. Um, so I, I don't know that they have a positive obligation. Um, I would think, um, I certainly think it's our job as individuals, right, to sort of spread the good news, right, spread the gospel of what markets can do for folks. And the best we can do um, is to try to think about those in ways that are convincing um, and are appealing to journalists. So um, I, for example, have written op-eds on some of my work um, about um, all kinds of things, but particularly about the economic impacts of um, political conventions and mega events and stadium subsidies and stuff. Turns out they're a giant transfer um, to wealthy folks, right? Paid for by taxpayers. Journalists really like that kind of stuff, right? Um, so if you can find ways to phrase your arguments for markets in ways that are palatable, that make it easy for journalists to pick up, I think that's a huge benefit. But I think the onus has to be on us as individuals. How do we help communicate with journalists? I think things like, for example, what Mercatus does, I'm not just saying that because they're affiliated with IHS. Um, I think there are some people doing God's work for this way. Um, and, and those kinds of things can help rather than sort of some kind of top down mandate about what should um, journalists do or not. And we have time for one last question, which is, uh, what do you think of the universal basic income? Could this be one example where the government can have a positive impact on poverty alleviation? Oh, I love that we're ending on this question because I, the UBI is like this temptress for me, okay? Um, like I love the potential theoretical idea of a UBI, right? So the idea that we'll scrap all the government programs with all of the horrible incentives, because I didn't even get into, like we could have talked about this, right, for days, but I didn't even get into um, issues like um, social programs being incredibly regressive and keeping poor, the poor in our country in poverty trapped, right? I didn't even get to all of that. Um, or the bad incentives of agricultural subsidies and other things. Um, so if we could just scrap all of that, um, and have one um, universal, just sort of dollar amount to everyone. Um, I think that's really cool and really appealing. Here's the problem though. Um, and as we'll discuss in my Sunday lecture, public choice is a thing. Uh, and I actually think, I think it's less likely, like the dream of a UBI without any other special interests or government interventions is more of a unicorn than open borders, right? And I think open borders um, is a maybe more valuable thing in terms of decreasing world poverty. Uh, but I think what happens is, let's say we were able to pass a UBI, right? Then what happens is everybody's got a UBI and, right? And then we have this special program for this group. And then we have corporate subsidies. Even if we didn't have things like TANF or food stamps or whatever, then we have these hidden corporate subsidies in other ways. We talk about things like increasing economic growth, right? Through um, building projects and all that Keynesian claptrap, right? So um, I, I would love, I would love it um, if, um, a UBI could be in existence. I've actually seen Mike Munger's talk on this and I think it's brilliant. Um, but I just don't think given public choice in our political context that it's a good idea because of that. 